We can't hear you. Hello, we can't hear you. So sorry. Yeah. Um, we'll be having an opening prayer here and then we will begin. All right. Yeah. Please go ahead. Lord, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. Thank you, God, for waking us up, Lord, and uh, protecting us over the night, Lord. And thank you for bringing us here together, Lord, so we can study about your word. And Lord, I want to pray that whatever we read, whatever we learn, you make give us wisdom so we can understand it, Lord. And Lord, I want to pray that you, whatever we gonna learn, you we apply those things into our life, Lord. And Lord, I pray that uh, for for the work for the for the studies, Lord, that you provide us knowledge so we can understand it even more. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. Uh, so. Good morning. We will um, begin with our first book of the Old Testament today. If you remember, last Monday we had our introductory class um, where we looked very briefly at the Hebrew Bible, the way the um, Hebrew Old Testament is arranged. They arrange their books uh, in a slightly different manner. We looked at some of the scrolls which they give very uh, great importance to. Uh, so th those are just some of the details which we looked at last time. Uh, so today we will get into the book of Genesis. And so from now on, uh, you know, each class, we will try to cover one or two books of the Old Testament, looking at some of the main highlights which are there in each of the books. Uh, so uh, if anyone has any doubt, anything that they would like to clarify, uh, those of us who are online, you can, you can just go ahead and post uh, your uh, question in the chat and those of you who are here it would be good if you uh, can raise your hand and in case I don't observe in case I don't realize it if someone can just bring it to my attention you know that you have raised your hand uh, then I will be able to answer your questions now regarding these Monday sessions uh, the issue is that immediately after I finish this class I would need to go and set up my laptop for another class upstairs, which means nobody can ask any questions after the class, you know, because I would be rushing upstairs to uh, get the laptop set up for the next session. So if you have any doubts which you would like to ask outside of the class, on Thursdays when we have the other session, um, after we finish our Thursday session, there would be about a 10 minute break before your supernatural hour begins. So maybe I would be able to, you know, answer um, any question that you have on Thursdays after the Thursday class before the supernatural hour begins. Also, if you would just like to come upstairs and, you know, during the next break, uh, the, you know, the, the break which comes after the second session, if you could just come to the upstairs room. I know you, you can, I can even clarify your doubts uh, during that break. So because of the kind of um, odd schedule, you know, I'm, um, I feel bad because some people come and ask something, but I simply do not have the time to even, you know, address that because I'll be rushing to the next thing uh, which is there. So please, uh, you can either just come upstairs during one of the breaks and ask your question or, you know, on Thursdays after the class, uh, for about 10 minutes, I would have time. So even at that time, you can come to me. Now, regarding the last session that we had when we were doing the introduction, if you have any questions or queries with regard to the things which we talked about specifically in last time's introductory session, if you have any doubts or questions, it would be good you know, if you can raise your hand um, and ask about that now itself you know, before we get into Genesis. In the same way, those of us who are online, anything that was talked about in the intro class, uh, so those, any any question pertaining to that, if you have, um, if you can raise your hand here or even on, on uh, yeah, online, if you can uh, post your question or in fact, just unmute. Uh, and, you know, if you, if you can just unmute and say, excuse me, ma'am, I know I'll be able to hear you. And then, uh, uh, so... 
we could do that. But if there is no question at all, then in that case, you know, we can get into uh, Genesis. All right. Yeah, because um, someone had a question last time and then there was no time to answer. And then, you know, I had to leave. Uh, so, OK, fine. Yeah. So. All right, then. Um, the book of Genesis uh, is. The English Bible uses the word Genesis. That's the Latin word. Um, it's talking, the word Genesis in Latin is talking about beginnings. Um, so in the Hebrew uh, Bible, uh, the name given to this book would be Bereshit. Bereshit also means beginnings. So technically, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. And in fact, you will see that in your you know, uh, class notes, where it talks about how Genesis describes the beginning of so many things, talks about the beginning of the universe itself talks about the beginning of human beings, talks about the beginning of the institution of marriage, talks about the beginning of uh, sin, the fall of people, uh, you know, um, temptation. So it talks about the beginning of a lot of things which are described uh, by the writer in the book of Genesis. Now, who is this writer? Who is this person who wrote the book of Genesis? Exactly. I mean, if we look at some of the scriptures, uh, we would see G, uh, God specifically asking Moses to write out certain things. Let's just look at one example, Exodus uh, 17, verse 14. Exodus 17, verse 14, if someone could um, uh, read out for us. And if anyone online would like to quickly unmute and read, that also would be fine. But you know, let's not waste too much time. Uh, yeah, so if we could immediately have someone read out, either online or over here, Exodus 17, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book um, as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So here, it's a specific instruction from the Lord saying, write this on a scroll. So there are some places where we see this uh, directive being given to Moses saying, write down these things. So which is why we generally say that the main writer of Genesis and in fact, the next uh, four books, all the five first, the first five books of the Old Testament are written by the main author, Moses. But you know, if you are a little aware of how a book is written, almost the same kind of practice would have been used even in those days. Yes, you would have the main author writing it out. But then if you if you know, you know, a book basically goes through even an ed editorial process, right? There would be others who would go through it in detail, you know, watch out for any grammatical errors. Um, uh, in case any explanatory notes have to be added, to what is already written, then the editor would attach those extra notes. So even the biblical books would have gone through that natural process of compilation. So usually what would happen is that God is speaking to one main person and he records most of whatever is God is you know, inspiring him and asking him to write down. And then maybe during his lifetime itself, or sometimes maybe even after his death, there would be other people of God who would bring all those writings together, put them in a particular order. And if any extra explanations have to be added, they would put in those editorial notes. Um, and so it would take maybe a few uh, generations for that particular biblical book to reach its final complete form. So even for Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, you know, this process would have taken place. Um, what do I mean by editorial comments? Let's just look at Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Genesis 14, verse 14. When Abraham heard that his re relative had been taken captive, he called out the third, three, one, 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. 
so it says that abram went as far as a place named dan you know a city named dan to get back his uh, nephew now this particular city of dan was not really there you know um, in the time of moses it was after the death of moses when when the promised land was divided among the various tribes at that point you know a city named dan came into existence so moses obviously would not have you know uh, given this little bit of explanation so whoever else was inspired by god would have added this extra detail because it would be helpful for the readers you know, so that they would have some clarity about exactly uh, you know the, the geographical dimensions and things like that so here and there there would be notes and explanations given which are not by the original main writer but also others but what are we promised in the new testament in the new testament the promise is very very clear we are told all scripture is inspired and god breathed so we are not insisting that only moses has the ability to be inspired by the holy spirit whomever god had appointed you know to to put down the things which are there in scripture the lord would have inspired all of those people in compiling the scriptures so we are not restricting god's ability and saying oh lord only if you were able to write through moses then yes your scripture is inspired but you know if, if certain if certain portions were added after the death of moses including the account which talks about how moses died how he was buried so whoever wrote those additional details they too would have been inspired uh, by the holy spirit to put down those details so we accept the fact that all of old testament scripture is god breathed it is god inspired he might have used the main author to write most of that particular book but in case there are any additional details which the lord specifically wanted added he would inspire whoever is available to add even those extra details so that every single word which we would need in the future to be included in the scriptures will definitely be there 100% so we can trust the lord that he is quite capable of doing his work and that he is quite capable of conveying to us every single word that we needed to hear from him and so you know we uh, so we accept the authorship of moses in this manner that they would that there would be other people also who would have been involved in compiling all the writings together placing them in a particular order adding any explanation if it was needed uh, and you know it would be updated until it reaches its final form okay so that's just regarding uh, not just this old testament book but in fact all the books of the old testament the same kind of process would have happened for all of the old testament uh, books so um why did god want this genesis account to be written out there are many reasons of course he wanted us to know the beginnings of so many things he wanted us to know how the universe came into existence he wanted us to know how humans were created so yes all these things are mentioned but if you look at the entire book of genesis there seems to be one uh, main purpose that god had in mind he wanted to show how he chose one particular nation one particular people for himself and used that nation as his tool to accomplish his purposes not just for those generations but in fact for all generations to come so when we look at this book of genesis we see god going through this process of choosing one person and then through that one person you know causing his descendants to grow into a mighty nation and then through that nation finally the messiah was sent i know who would in fact um save the entire world so we see the story of this one chosen person and his descendants so the main focus of genesis seems to be uh, on that uh, when we you know we were covering this particular uh, topic in one of the earlier batches someone had asked the question they said uh, ma'am why did uh, god choose abraham god could have chosen someone from india right i mean god could have chosen someone from an, any nation 
why why was abraham chosen um so maybe we can look at some scriptures you know which throw light on this um if we could have someone read out for us joshua chapter 24 uh, verses 2 and 3 it talks a little bit about abraham and his background joshua chapter 24 verses 2 to 3 please and joshua said to the to all the people thus says the lord god of israel your father included in terah the father of abraham and the father of nohar nahor dwelt on the other side of the river river in the old times and they served other gods then i took your father abraham from the other side of the river led him throughout all the land of canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him isaac yeah and then if you could also read for us genesis chapter 12 verse 1 Now the Lord had said to Abraham get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you Now in these two passages which we just read out now we see that Abraham's ancestors and in fact probably Abraham as well were all idol worshipers they were not followers of the true and living God so God comes to Abraham reveals himself as the true living god and asks him are you willing to make a commitment so in genesis chapter 12 verse 1 the lord says are you willing to go up from your country go away from your people in fact leave your father's household behind and start a new beginning are you willing to give up everything that your you know household stands for you know because their household was a household of idol worshipers so is he willing to give up that household and is he willing to go forward only with the living god leaving behind all the other gods so it was a decision which he had to take so at that time the lord was searching to look for one person who will be willing to make this commitment so it just so happened that you know abraham was there in that particular land so if that particular person had been in india then i guess the, you know india would have been the place from where uh, you know this um, uh, descendants of the chosen nation would have risen up so it just so happened that abraham was one person who had a heart who would be willing to do this be willing to turn his back on the um, idols of his household and be willing to follow only the true and living god and also there's something else that God says in his scripture about why he chose this Abraham. Uh Genesis 18 verses 18 and 19. Genesis 18, 18 and 19. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nation of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order to order that he make command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the lord to the to do righteousness and justice that the lord may bring to abraham what he has spoken to him now uh, that verse 19 uh, you know in the version which was read out it says for i have known him that particular hebrew word can also be translated as i have chosen him that is in fact the translation which is used in the niv so god says i have chosen this man so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the lord the lord was looking for a man who will not only follow him but who will also teach the same thing to his household and to his descendants because they would need to continue being faithful to this living god you know if one day the messiah is supposed to come through that particular lineage so the lord was looking for a man who would have that deep sense of faithfulness loyalty and responsibility and in fact i think the lord would be looking for that even from uh, people today you know so um in most cultures it is just assumed that when it comes to spiritual matters the mother the mummy will look after that 
she will you know teach the children the bible verses and help them in uh, in, in uh, growing in the things of god because daddy is very very busy he has to go and earn money and make them all rich you know that's the kind of um, uh, worldly concept that exists you know in our homes but if you look at what god wanted god wanted the man especially of a home to take that spiritual responsibility where not just he is being faithful to the lord and he is tithing but he makes sure that his entire household is also following the lord that is what the lord expects he wants not just uh, that individual to follow him he wants that individual to take the responsibility of training up his entire household in following the lord so in this is like a responsibility which abraham was willing to shoulder he passed it on to his son isaac isaac did pass it on to esau and jacob but then we see that esau later rejects uh, you know what has been passed on to him uh, so for these specific reasons god chooses abraham and so the descendants who come from abraham become the chosen people of god um, that is just regarding uh, you know the story of this special people how they originated why they got chosen and uh, those details are given to us in the book of genesis now if you look at genesis overall the structure of genesis maybe we could divide it into three main subsections chapters 1 to 11 is generally considered as the first main section of genesis because in this first 11 chapters uh, we we get to know the uh, story of the beginnings you know uh, man is created man falls sin and death comes into the world um, and then uh, sin increases to such an extent uh, that that mankind becomes so evil that the lord uh, is angered and so then the flood is brought as a punishment and one person who is faithful to the lord he is saved from the time of the flood and he carries on the human race after that so all these important uh, initial things are mentioned in this first 11 chapters so maybe we could say that the first main subsection of genesis is genesis chapters 1 to 11 the next main section would be chapters 12 um up to 36 so in chapters 12 to 36 that is where we see genesis chapter 12 verse 1 is where the story of abraham begins so now god starts making preparations on how to redeem these wicked people who have fallen into sin so his redemption plan starts in genesis chapter 12 verse 1 and it goes on all the way uh, we can say maybe up to uh, chapter 36 because once you come to chapter 37 in genesis chapter 37 up to uh, 50 there we see how the lord is using you know um you using the descendants of abraham you know to preserve and protect the people of god uh, because you have um, um you have this um, jacob and i uh, jacob and joseph and all of these people and their specific contribution you know in continuing the lineage of uh, abraham uh, so when we are just talking about you know chapters 37 to 50 and we are looking at the life that was led by jacob by joseph um how did god look at them in god's eyes uh, what did he see in these people so let's just look very briefly at these uh, at abraham and these descendants of abraham from god's perspective uh, that would be described in hebrews chapter 11 verses 9 and 10 uh, if someone could read out for us hebrews 11 verses 9 and 10 by f- by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country dwelling in the tent with the isaac and jacob the higher the heirs with him of the same promise for he await he waited for the city which has foundation whose builder and maker is god it talks here about abraham and isaac and jacob as people who were living like strangers in a foreign country god made a promise to them 
that he would be you know that god says to abraham are you willing to give up your home your land and go to the place where i'm taking you and abraham says yes lord i'm willing and then after he goes over there does god build him a big bungalow and say see i have established you here no abraham isaac jacob they all continue to live in tents like temporary pilgrims and the land is still not their own the promise has been given but they are still living by faith and why are they choosing to continue believing in this living god even though he has not you know established that entire place and turned it over to them it's because by faith they are holding on to him they know that if they hold on to this living god one day there will be an eternal inheritance so it says so beautifully in you know, hebrews 11 verse 10 for abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is god and you have a little more clarification regarding this in the uh, you know the next few verses so if someone could read out hebrews 11 13 to 16 hebrews 11 13 to 16 These all died in faith, not having uh, received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embracing them of uh, confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a home homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would had opportunity to return. but now they desire a better that is a heavenly country therefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he has prepared a city of them now when we look at these people abraham and his descendants who are described in uh, the book of genesis it's very easy to look at their faults their weaknesses their defects and say ah these people were nothing great about them but if you knew when you read about uh, them in hebrews 11 you realize it was not easy for them they had moved over there to a foreign land given up everything which was familiar and what god had promised he has not yet fulfilled in their lives the land still belongs to the locals the locals are still looking at them as outsiders the number of times isaac you know digs a well and then they come and steal his well again he goes to another place digs a new well they you know they they attack even that so again and again even though the promise has been made they have not it received that promise in all of its fullness but these people these early descendants of abraham continue to hold on to god because their eyes are not just on the physical blessings if their eyes had only been on the physical blessings like it says in hebrews uh, 11 verse uh, 15 they could have gone back to their homeland no they could have gone back uh, uh, to ur but they choose not to do that because they have decided this is the living god and he has a city prepared for us eternally so they hold on to him even though you know they have the promise which has been given to them has not yet been completely fulfilled so we see this uh, in uh, hebrews 11 verse 13 where it says all these people were still living by faith when they died they did not receive the things promised they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth so they could see in the distance that one day their descendants would literally own the entire land they looked into the distance and they saw that god's promise that one day their descendants would be kings in the land and they accepted it by faith and they continue to follow so actually the book of genesis can teach us deep spiritual lessons especially because now we are currently living in a world where it is the material things which are most prioritized people are ranked and valued based on how much money they have how much property they have uh, what their status is power wise politics wise those are the priorities so christians can be very led away by these priorities if the lord is not giving them what they are hungering for and aching for they are not getting the promotions which they thought god would give them if he is not adding to their property 
if he is not adding to their status in society, they may think, oh, okay, where's the point in following this God? Let's go back to what you know we had earlier. This, there can be a temptation. But if you look at these people, we can draw from their example, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who went through so many struggles and they had not yet received what was promised to them. Why did they hold on when they have not yet received what was promised? They are holding on because their eyes are on eternal values. It repeats that two times. In verse 10, it says they were looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect is God. Yes, today we are living in a tent. But one day, I will be living in a city built by God himself. And in the same way, if you look at the latter verse in verse um, uh, 16, it says they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So one main thing that maybe we can learn from this Genesis account of these very imperfect human people, you know, Abraham and Jacob and Isaac, one thing that we can learn from them even though they might have been very, very weak and imperfect, they had a longing in their heart. And that longing was for that eternity which God has prepared for them. And that is why it says God was not ashamed to be called their God. They had their imperfections. They had their downfalls. But God was not ashamed to be called their God because here was a people who had not yet received everything promised and still was in by faith holding on. They could only see from afar, from a distance, that one day God will do this for them. And that was enough. God has given his word. He will fulfill it, fulfill it. And so by faith, they held on. So in case we think of Genesis as just a bunch of stories, yes, it is stories. But these are stories of faith. They are stories of struggle. They are stories of times when the pressure was high and they fell into temptation. Yes, it, it is stories of all of that. But in the center of it, they are a people who had faith and held on. And God says in the New Testament, he wants it recorded in, in Hebrews. So he makes the writer record those words and say, I, the Lord, was not ashamed to be called their God because they had faith in me and they valued what I have to offer eternally. So that can be one main learning for us from this uh, book of Genesis. Now let's come to some specific passages in Genesis. Maybe we can call them the highlights of Genesis. Um, you know, because of time limitations, we'll only look at a few important things. But these are things that, you know, can be um, of practical value to us. So the first thing that maybe we can look at is God's institution of marriage and what God had in mind, you know, for people when he first created this institution of marriage. Um, so if we could have someone read out for us Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. Genesis 2, 22 to 24. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So this, these words were spoken, of course, by, um, you know, Adam. Uh, but it was recorded either by Moses or, you know, someone else whom the Lord inspired uh, to write down and record these particular words. So during the time of Moses and during the time of the people who, you know, um, wrote down the things, uh, who recorded the things about Genesis, this was not the culture. The men did not leave their home and go to the wife's household and live over there in the wife's household. That was just never the culture in the Mediterranean region. It was always the women who left their home and came and dwelt in the home of the husband. So over here, it's not talking about a cultural uh, practice which God has laid down. It's talking about a spiritual principle that God has laid down. Because if you look at um, you know uh, Adam's immediate response when he sees Eve, 
this is what he says he says this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh uh, that's the wording that he uses what was the meaning of this phrase for the hebrew people when they used this kind of a phrase what did they mean let's look at the same phrase being used in some of the other places in our uh, old testament let's look at genesis chapter 29 verse 14 genesis 29 14 And Laban said to him, "Surely you are my bone and my flesh." And he stayed with him for a month. Here it talks about Laban saying these words to Jacob. He says to Jacob, "You are my bone and my flesh." So that word, that phrase, is talking about family. You are my family. So yes, come and stay here with us. Be with us. We are glad to have you. So Laban uses this term over here to 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 Jacob, saying, "You are my bone and my flesh." Let's look at the same thing again uh, in Second um, Samuel five, verse one. Second Samuel chapter five, verse one. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at his bourn and spoke, saying, "Indeed, we are yours, bone and your flesh." So here you have the tribes of Israel coming to David and saying, "You know what? We are your bone, we are your flesh." So they are saying, "You know, we are all part of the same family. So please come and rule over us. Don't rule just over Judah. Don't rule just over Benjamin. We are also your bone and flesh. So come and rule even over us." So if you So we see that when Adam looks at Eve for the first time, he immediately accepts her as his own personal family. He doesn't look at her as a competitor who has come, you know, to to take his place in the garden. No, he immediately accepts her as his own, as his family. And then look at the connecting words which are used in your Genesis chapter two. So in verse twenty uh, three. Adam says this about uh, the lady who has been brought to him, and in verse twenty-four it says, "That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh." Why does a man leave his father and mother? It is because this woman is not just another human who has been created. This person is supposed to be this man's family, his very own. So here it's not talking about a man physically leaving his household and going and settling down in the in the bride's household it's talking about a spiritual principle where emotionally he's willing to take that responsibility and say this lady who has been given to me by god as my wife she is now my family so my loyalty my first priority my first loyalty is now lo no longer to my father and mother but to this woman whom god has given to me as my you know in a covenant relationship to be my responsibility because in that patriarchal society of the mediterranean region you know where they were living in moses times men were important sons were important women had lost worth and value to such an extent that they were almost just property you know i mean you marry uh, basically so that you know you're bringing her as property along with her you also get some actual property in the in the in, in the form of camels and gold and all of that and so god specifically inspires either moses or someone else to write down record these words in the book of genesis to declare Adam uh, saying that Adam recognized the value of his wife he understood that she is meant to be his own and because in the same way he recognized it therefore in the same way all men should no longer consider their father and mother as their first priority rather their loyalty should be to their wife so it is a very counter cultural thing which god was introducing into the into the patriarchal society of moses times 
God was declaring and saying, remember what I originally had in mind when I created man and woman. Why have you, you know, brought down the institution of marriage to a level where the wife is not even being respected? So God um, reminds the society of Moses' times that his original stand was that this lady who is coming from an, out, from an outside home should no longer be regarded as an outsider, but she must be regarded as bone and flesh as a family member and uh, you know the man's priority should be that towards her now does this verse apply to men alone what about the wives what does this book of genesis say about wives it's very very interesting um let's look at genesis chapter okay we will look at um, genesis chapter 3 verse 16 where God is giving the consequences of the fall. You know, where the Adam and Eve have sinned, and now these are the consequences which will come as a result of their uh, sinful disobedience. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, if someone could read out. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So there are two consequences mentioned in this verse, which are a result of, you know, the sinful disobedience. One, of course, is the pain in childbearing. And the other consequence, it says over here, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Again, what is this phrase talking about over here? It's the same kind of a phrase repeated somewhere else in the Old Testament. In fact, it's repeated in the very next chapter. So let's look at that as well. Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Genesis 4, 6 to 7. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou hurt? And why this thick contents fallen? If thou dost not well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin laid at the door and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shall rule over him okay yeah um we're kind of running out of time so yes i'll just go ahead but please in our class i do not want anyone to use that bible which has got thee and thou that is uh, shakespeare english which nobody uses nowadays. So it will be difficult for you to understand. It will be difficult for me to understand because that English is no longer in use in our every... So we, we want to be able to understand the Bible. So anyone who's having a Bible which uses thee and thou, that's going to be very complicated English, which you will not be able to understand. That Bible will not be able to help you. So... At least let you know use any other version which does not have the the thou. And that's just basically uh, for those from non-English backgrounds, because you may not be aware. We do not use the and thou in current English. So let's use a Bible which uses modern day English. Yes, let's quickly get into this. So here God is talking to Cain, and this is what God says to Cain about sin. He says, Sin is at your door, and he says, Sin has a is, is sin's desire is for you but you should rule over it. The same wording is used regarding Eve and the same wording is used over here for Cain. It's talking about um, sin's desire to control and dominate Cain. But the Lord says to Cain, you know what? You need to rule over it. Don't allow sin to dominate and control. So going back to Genesis 3.16 where, where God uses the same wording for Eve, God is saying, you no longer respect your husband as your husband. Because of the fall, your desire will be for him. You will want to dominate him. You will want to control him. You will not want to submit to him anymore. But because he's a man, he will rule over you. He's going to use his strength for all the wrong means. And he will instead dominate over you. So it's a very sad state of affairs which sin brought into the world. But God's original purpose is that they should consider each other as bone and flesh. And they should no longer prioritize their 
father and mother which is their you know former household but they should value their current household where they both together are making up the family unit and that is why you have in ephesians and colossians uh, where it talks about to the wives it says submit to your husbands yes your desire will be to dominate and control your husband but submit to him as you would unto the lord in fact it says in colossians uh, yeah and to the wife in the same way and, and to the husband in the same way the lord says love her the way you would love yourself so um in genesis what god had originally instituted that is what he would like the believers to practice okay so um we don't really have much time left uh, but then if we could uh, just dwell upon uh, genesis chapter 3 verse 15 where it talks about uh, you know the messiah and what's going to happen in the future so uh, if someone could just read out for us genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and i will put enmity between the and the woman and between the seed and the seed it shall brise the head and thou shall brise his heel okay yeah um yeah so here it's talking about how the serpent will bruise the head of the woman's descendant and uh, how the woman's descendant will bruise the head of the serpent so when it talks about the head being bruised um those are the wordings over there it says he that is the woman's descendant shall bruise your head what exactly is this talking about in the ima- in the imagery of those old testament times when a king would conquer another ruler you know he would throw him to the ground in fact he would place his leg on the face of the fallen king and declared that now i have you know defeated you and i have completely and totally conquered you so the victorious king literally places his foot on the face on the head of the defeated king in that sense the victorious king is bruising the head of the fallen uh, you know enemy and this is what god did for us jesus christ did for us he was always victor i mean god was never defeated right he he was uh, satan never ever defeated god but we were one fallen defeated bunch of people because of what adam did so for our sake on our behalf jesus came and fought our battle for us and he won the victory on our behalf and he placed his foot firmly on the face of the devil and declared you stand defeated so now everyone who becomes my follower will automatically have the same victory which i have enjoyed because i will help them to walk in that victory over satan and his demons okay so uh, that is the beauty of what we see over here so long before any of these things uh, happen in the old testament times itself in genesis itself god says to the serpent and says you will try to uh, strike his heel you know you will one day put him on the cross you will one day try to crucify him but you know what he will bruise your head and you will be completely and totally you know defeated that is a declaration which god makes to satan right in the beginning in the book of genesis itself and that is why um as the bell has not rung we can escape with one more verse uh first corinthians 2 verses 7 and 8 if someone could read out first corinthians 2 7 and 8 please and quickly please first corinthians now, 2 now we declare god's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that god designed for our glory before time began none of the rulers of this age understood it for if they had they would not have crucified the lord of glory what a lovely verse it says over here none of the rulers of this age understood god's hidden plan they thought they were striking the heel of the woman's descendant they thought oh we are finishing him 
you know, we are going to conquer this Messiah. They did not understand that God would use this very plan of Satan to bring God, uh, to bring the Messiah out victorious and he would bruise the, uh, the serpent's head permanently. So God overturns Satan's plan. Yeah, it is what we see over here. So these are just some few truths that we could see from the book of Genesis. Uh, if, if we could all just close our eyes, we'll close with a word of prayer. Lord, your scriptures are filled with marvelous truths which can transform our thinking. And if we apply them, in fact, transform our very lives and our future. So, oh Lord, the few things that we are able to learn uh, during our sessions, we pray, oh Lord, that we would that you would help us to hold on to them, remind ourselves of them, apply and practice them in our own lives so that, Lord, we can have the kind of future which you have destined for us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you.